uh, for longer than that, and I know it uh, well uh, preceded me. Um, and in fact, uh, when I came to New York, I, I was interested in Haskell, but I didn't know much. Um, I was just teaching myself, and couldn't meet anyone else that had even heard of the damn language. Um, but I came to a lot of uh, List NYC meetups, and I used to talk people's ear off about Haskell there. And uh, uh, now, one thing, of course, is that you learn that uh, one should not uh, talk too much about types. Because it, 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 or that was a good way to end the evening, but not to begin it. Um, and so I, I just decided, well, let's not talk about types among lispers. We got enough in common with regard, regardless. Uh, now, so therefore, Ray asked me to give a talk on uh, homotopy type theory, which is the, the reading group that uh, Dustin also has uh, been co-organizing uh, with me. Hi, Dustin at Google. And um, it's, I said, well, gee, I said, okay, because sure. And then it occurred to me that. Well, gosh, uh, there's a problem with talking to Lisp about homotopy type theory, which is you got this word right there in the name of the subject, type. <laughs> and um, so I spent a lot of time thinking about how am I going to talk about types to Lispers? Um, and I, I think I've come up with a good way to do it, which I think is a very different approach. And, and it, it involves talking about type theory in the sense that it has nothing to do with computer programming and the types of computer programs. Now, of course, it, it actually does because they're all the same thing. But we're not approaching it from the standpoint of caring about that. We're going to approach it from an entirely different standpoint in this talk. And hopefully that is uh, going to, uh, well, well, I'll try to make the case. So this is just throat clearing. Um, and uh, I, I, the, the other point is, yeah, is, as the notes described, I am going to uh, present a, uh, a, a dependent type system in uh, roughly 100 lines of scheme for the core of it. And then there's, there's more bits added on and whatever. And, uh, I'll give some citations at the end of all the people I looked at and sort of how I learned to put two and two and up, and up together to do that. And hopefully we'll get through both a bunch of sort of more general points about dependent type systems in the beginning and walk through the core of the implementation at the end. Um, so here we go. Um, yeah, th th this gets to the problem. Uh, do types have the list nature, right? Uh, right actually, let, let me take, how many people here in the audience consider themselves more lispers than sort of morally than in any other sort of language or tradition. All right. All right, so this is actually a pretty mixed audience, but a lot of folks know what I mean when I say the Lisp nature, right? And you say, you know, and then there's arguments, does closure actually have the Lisp nature? Well, probably yes, you know. Someone said Python had the Lisp nature. That, that, that can start a fight, right? So, <laughs> um, so you know what it is when you see it. Do types have the Lisp nature? Well, obviously they don't, right? Um, <coughs> right? In Lisp, everything is homoiconic, everything is the same, everything is manipulable. But with types, you have these two levels. You have the stuff that you're programming, you have this other stuff about it, and it's not as first class, it's not as manipulable, and, and so clearly it can't. And, uh, right? and uh, similarly, uh, types aren't code, and they're not exactly data, there's this other funny thing attached. And your program is no longer one thing, and types are all about enforcing a compile time runtime distinction so that you can tell things ahead of time and then make your program faster. But your compiler should be able to figure that out for you. Why are you making the programmer worry about distinctions that are not really about the meaning of your program? Right? These are all the things that people will say about type systems, even in a language like Haskell and certainly in a language like uh, C or Java or something. And um, I mean, we can argue about whether or not you, what good type systems are or aren't there. But I, I, I will readily concede types do not have the list nature, all right? So, so, so why should you care about types? Well, I claim that dependent type theories, like I'm going to talk about, do have the list nature. And they are a unitary system. And, and that, in fact, was their purpose, is to be a unitary system. It just starts in a slightly different place. And um, we're going to try to build up to that. And, and, and that's why this relates. And, and here again, you have the same thing. People try to sell you dependent types, and you know, it, uh, again, it wasn't a big buzzword maybe uh, 10 years ago, but today, you hear people talking about it every con you, at conferences you wouldn't expect, and you're going to have your uh, Curry Howard lecture, which I think is great, because you know, uh, I didn't learn Curry Howard when I was in school. That wasn't considered important, and now at least you know, you, you'll go to even you know, a, a majority Java conference or something. Someone's going to be talking about it. Um, well, some Java code or something, you're like, what does this have to do with logic? But, <laughs> they'll at least be talking about it. Um, so people talk about dependent type theories, and they'll say, um, well, dependent type theories are great because it gives your programming language really powerful types. And I don't know. I mean, I, I, if, if you're not sold on why your programming language should have types at all, why do you care if they're more powerful? I mean, this is like, you know, throwing good money after bad. Like, what are you, OK, so, so I'm not going to make that case. Uh, or dependent types uh, are a system for proving mathematical statements. Now, that's a bit closer to home. but. 
well, gosh, there's a lot of systems for proving mathematical statements. And uh, some of the most uh, popular one, you know, honestly, I, I can take a statement, I can put it into Mathematica and just crunch it out, and it'll give you a number. Okay, did I prove the statement? Well, I asked Mathematica to solve it for me. Um, or uh, there's, in fact, more formal systems even, such as MISO, that are not based in dependent type theories. And uh, they've actually got more for mathematics formalized in them than dependent type theories. So, so that in its own, it's, it's, again, maybe not the best argument for how we should think about dependent types. And, and, and I came up with a notion of dependent types that I think is close to what Lispers care about in the historic roots of how people use Lisp in research. And it's a definition. Well, it's not a definition, but it's a description below, which is a system for representing knowledge, right? Lispers love that, right? It's a system for representing knowledge in a structured way, and it's equipped, which is what you don't normally have in these types of things, with an algorithmic procedure for verification. So you can represent just knowledge in general, any sort you want, is the claim. And it comes with a procedure that says, this is how we verify that knowledge. Now, of course, you know, if you want to verify some knowledge, you might say the algorithm can't all run on a computer. But it, it comes equipped with a notion of verification that is sort of philosophically considered a genuine notion. And, and that uh, pre-exists, uh, the, the, in fact, of the idea of running independent type systems on computers at all. Uh, and goes, did, Lou, did you have a question? Yeah, so what's the difference between having a system for A, proving mathematical statements, and B, for representing knowledge equipped with an algorithmic procedure for verification? Uh, so Lou's asking what's the difference between these two definitions. They seem very much the same. Um, I, 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 honestly, I, I, I think um, if you're coming from the right standpoint, they do seem the same. I think this sounds a lot more enticing to listeners is the okay. big difference. Um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and also, I, I think that there are systems for proving mathematical statements which are not this, which are not the bottom one, right? Like I said, for example, I can give you um, I can give you stones, and then you know if you want to verify that you know two plus two equals four, you take two stones, two two stones, and you count them. That's a system for proving mathematical statements. <laughs> Um, now, in fact, that is actually also a system for representing knowledge, equipped with a procedure for verification. But um, maybe if I give you, uh, again, Mathematica, unless you've checked the code yourself or whatever, maybe, you know, in what sense is it really verified? It's just I put it in the box and out came something. So, um, so I would claim that there's a stronger thing being done here. And in a sense, actually, what we've got is a lot more like a really souped up version of counting stones. Um, and, and that's part of the point of it. Is it's that uh, is and why it was developed? Is it is it's something that you can, in a sense, really believe in? All right. Um, so let, let's talk about uh, logics. Uh, uh, propositional logic has statements like A or B implies C, right? And you know, a, and then that's just and, and you can build things out of those <coughs> connectives, and you have a few more and and whatever. Uh, and uh, then you step up and you get first order logic, and now you have quantifiers. So I can say for all x, p of x implies q of x. So the first thing we'll notice in propositional logic, A, B, and C must be true or false, right? That, that's because they're, they're just an atomic term and you can assign them to true or false and then either your uh, sort of relation on these propositions holds or it doesn't. Uh, in first order logic, P of X, right? That P is not true or false. It's a property of X. So X is not a Boolean necessarily. X, if you're just doing things in sort of the general philosophical logic sense, X is just a thing in the world that you've decided to talk about and P of X is whether or not this thing in the world has this property. Right? So I can point to this and say, let this be X and let the property be is black. And then, yes, the microphone is black. And you can use first order logic. And then you have quantifiers as well, because you can quantify over sort of collections of things in the world for whatever sort of world you want to talk about. You can restrict your <coughs> and so forth. Um, now, you have higher order logic. And higher order logic, your, your, your P and your Q, don't need, really need to quantify over things in the world. They can quantify over other propositions as well, right? And, and so here we have for all p, p of x implies exists p of y. So now um, exists y such that p of y. So, so, so now we're quantifying over uh, propositions. And that makes things, uh, right, because we have for all p instead of for all x. That, that, that's the piece that I'm trying to um, get at here is in this one, I can quantify over the set of like rocks or the set of like things I can point to. In this one, I can quantify over propositions I can say about such things. And, and, and these are just these are sort of well known in philosophy and logic. These are the sorts of systems that people like to work with, some very basic ones. And so now, just to begin our journey into uh, inventing a dependent type theory, uh, let's say, you know. Um, you know, Lispers like to write programs to do things like manipulate uh, symbolic uh, statements. And 
very often, you know, you, 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 there'll be things where you've got some of the first computer algebra systems, and, you know, I give you a sequence of strings represented, you know, as con cells, and uh, then I can, like, manipulate them algorithmically, and then it'll, like, you know, calculate the derivative or something for me in a symbolic form. That, that, that's a very good strength of list. It's something where some of the first systems to do that came out of. Uh, people still have great systems in it that do that. Let's say instead of talking about mathematical formula, we just want to talk about logical formula with all these quantifiers. Let's represent them in lists the same way. Just, you know, con cells and names and stuff in this sort of, just like magic them up out of con cells and just glue stuff together to represent uh, logic. And, and just like we could with other stuff that we do in the left, right? And um, uh, so we, we, we pick lists to be our world of things we're going to quantify over as well. So our world are things we can say in lists. And the things we're going to say about them are going to be special types of objects and lists that, you know, are formed out of, you know, sort of our symbols, uh, including and and or and uh, thus forth. And we'll call them product and co-product or and and or and function or implies. Uh, right? They go by many names. They, they all sort of work the same. Um, and along with that, we're going to introduce quantifiers. Again, just in lisp as lisp, right? Just, just throwing together a syntax to represent logical statements that we want to talk about in the world. And um, we'll write them as chi and sigma, um, dependent product and dependent sum. Uh, I'll need to come back and explain those a bit, because it's sort of the heart of dependent types. Uh, but you can think of them as uh, for all and exists in a certain way. And so the pi sort of looks like an A, and the sigma sort of looks like the E for exists. Yes, yeah, sure. it's, it's, it's facing the wrong way, but it's sort of. You can sort of squint and see. Um, and I, later we'll talk about why we call them dependent product and dependent sum too. But there's other ways to pronounce it too that maybe work a bit better informally. Instead of reading pi as um, for all, you can read it as if given a. Or even better, give me a. So I, I, if I have pi of x of type a uh, implies b, then I'll say give me an x of type a and I will give you a b. Right? So you can read it in this sort of this game theoretic sense where you really put yourself in the action and you pretend that you're the computer or, or the person who's executing this. Um, and sigma similarly, which is exists, it's actually stronger in our sense. And you want to say there is given a. <coughs> so if there is given a x such that p of x, that, or even better, I have it. I have it. Here it is. I'm holding it. I, it's a term in list, but got it. All right. So. Um, so, so here are some things we can say. For all x of type nat, x is greater than 10 implies x is greater than 5. Sure. For all x of type nat, x is greater than 10 implies less, x is less than 5. We can say that too. Right? I've just told you how to put sentences together. I can tell you for all cheese, for x of type cheese, not x implies crackers. Okay, this is a valid, right? I, I, there's nothing that rules any of these out. None of these is more nonsensical than the other. And so, and this gets to what I was talking about earlier, the syntax for logic is not a language for logic. We're missing something. If I just give you a bunch of quantifiers and a way to assemble them, I haven't given you a system for anything. I, I've just, you know, given you some concepts. So, um, there's a classic example. This comes from Noam Chomsky in 1955. Um, and I think it is a PhD thesis, or right around there, very early in his career, obviously. Um, he came up with the sentence, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a perfectly well-formed grammatical sentence. So the point is, if you have a recognizer for the English language that goes through and understands all the rules of grammar, and you give it this, it'll say, yes, that is an English sentence. But obvious, so there's obviously something missing from this. Now, he used it for a slightly different point, but uh, this is the point people tend to make. Is It's not enough to say that, you know, we know where verbs and adjectives and adverbs go, and therefore we've described the English language. Because the English language comes with some notion of reference, content. It's a notion of understanding, not just a pure form of structure. Uh, so, um, this is a problem that was tackled by logicians a long time ago. Right? They didn't have con cells, but they had formula they wrote on pieces of paper. And they wanted to say, well, what, what is the meaning of these things? Is it, is, it, is it simply a set of rules for them manipulating them? Uh, how can we justify them? I'm not going to talk about constructivist or intuitionistic math. <coughs> That's sort of a whole separate two hours. Uh, what I do want to talk about, though, is uh, a bunch of constructivists, or at the time, intuitionists, uh, following Brouwer's intuitionism, came up with um, a notion of reading statements. And I'm going to mention if you know something about intuitionism. Um, in fact, the PHP interpretation is compatible with the excluded middle. So it's not a constructivist interpretation per se, or an intuitionistic interpretation per se. Um, and, um, and, 
and this is, so they say, how do I know if like some collection of symbols, you know, x greater than five implies x less than five, right? You know, how, how do I know if this is true or false? How do I assign it meaning? How do I talk about it? And they'll say, well, a proof of the, you know, the formalism A and B is given by presenting two proofs, one of A, one of B. A proof of the formalism A or B is given by presenting either a proof of A or a proof of B. A proof of A implies B is a construction whereby one, and construction is a very vague term here on purpose, one takes a proof of A and turns it into a proof of B. That's coming off the edge here. Or a proof of not A is a proof of A implies false, where false is a term that we just say a priori has no proof. And that lets you derive a contradiction. Well, a proof of for all A, little a is an element of big A, uh, P of A. It's a proceed, right? So for all A, um, for all little a, P holds of A. That's a procedure that holds, converts any element of big A into a proof of P of little a. So, um, and, and they call this the uh, BHK interpretation, and it was developed semi-independently uh, from 1908 through 1932 or 34, depending on who you read and sort of exactly their twist on it. And they said, well, this is a way that I can take a formalism on the page and say, what does it mean to have a proof of this, of this uh, mathematical formula that's written? Well, if I have a proof that A and B holds, well, I'd better be able to look at the page somewhere and find the proof of A and look somewhere else and find the proof of B and so forth. And, uh, so that's not bad. Uh, uh, people built on that. Uh, uh, you hit uh, Keeney's uh, realizability in 1945. Uh, and here, um, I think I, I, each one has a slogan. This is propositions are problems, proofs are constructions. So a proposition is like a problem or a puzzle, right? And a proof is a construction that you say satisfies the constraints, right? So it could be, uh, metaphorically speaking, um, right? Uh, a proposition is a Lego spaceship, and a proof is I built the spaceship out of Legos or something. I don't know. It's sort of silly. Um, so here, realizability has a slightly different slogan. Uh, formulae as specifications, proofs as numerical realizers. So I'm not going to, uh, people know what uh, Goodell codes are? Who doesn't? doesn't. Okay. Um, I, I don't know, I, I can't really do, I'm not going to go through a whole Goodell code formalism here. But um, the notion, right, and this is pivotal to proving Goodell's theorem, which we're again not going to do in this talk, is that you can take functions, Right, in the sense of, say, mathematical functions or propositions in some first order logic and some mathematical elements of them. And you, you can write them out as numbers according to some transformation that's yeah. given. Um, I, I, I'm not doing a great job of it. Yeah, and you yeah. can do that to their proofs yeah. as well. Let, let, let's do it the short way. Okay. Let's suppose we have how many ASCII characters? Oh, there we go. Yes, let's do it that way. Let's do it the short way. Yeah. So, yes, here's a dumb, good, this is not the version Grinnell came up with, right. but it is but a it works. version is I have a proposition, I can write it down in text editor. It, it I can open it. it up and read off the binary, and that's a number. Yeah. So now I've, I've gone and I've converted anything I can say about math into a number, right? And everything that I can say about math has a different unique number. Um, so that's one way, and, and so in Cleany's formalism, he uh, did just hating arithmetic, and he, he turned, not by that, but a different mechanism, every proposition in the, in the system into another number. And so a proof is a number. And so to every valid formulae, you can just come up with the number. And that number is, is the proof. And for invalid formulae in this formalism, you can't come up with a number. So you would say that the number realizes uh, the truth of the statement. And so this is sort of a more rigorous way than uh, the, the BHK thing, which is, you know, well, what's a construction or whatever. Well, construction is a number. Here's a procedure to have a number. Well, and more importantly, you can actually have a fixed procedure using yes. basic arithmetic operation that checks that the thing really is a proof. Yeah, exactly, and then you have, so you, yes, uh, as you can have a fixed procedure that checks the thing as a proof, although he wasn't thinking exactly in those terms. Yeah. Well, he, 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 he was, he was, he was the building up the other direction. Davis and Robinson. But what he did have is he had rules the other way, because I can give you what to have A and B means, right? In our case, if they're ASCII, I could say, well, I'm going to put a new line between them and then have them after each other. Yeah. But, you give a construction of what and means, you give a construction of what or means, and it's all coded in the bit patterns. Uh, so there's another way um, that you can sort of build up these systems and build up a very formal notion of a proof, although I wouldn't like to read one of them. Um, and now uh, that brings us up to the Curry-Howard correspondence, uh, the famous Curry-Howard correspondence. Uh, and this is actually developed by Howard in 68 or 69. Uh, his paper is now on uh, the web and accessible. On the, uh, and uh, in his notion, <coughs> Propositions are types, and uh, proofs are lambda terms, and, and that, that's a famous slogan of uh, propositions. 
as types that everyone knows about. Uh, and he actually encoded uh, the lambda terms in terms of sets. Um, and so in this construction, propositions directly correspond to the types of these terms. And um, in fact, uh, Howard introduced, and not everyone knows this, you have to go read the paper, because people talk about it less. He introduced not just the Curry Howard correspondence, the dependent type system in that paper, where when he formalizes hating arithmetic, he actually allows types to depend on terms. And uh, it's not quite one as we recognize it, but it, it actually got you a lot further than you would think. And I won't go into the nitty gritty here. So he's very far sighted. And um, one of the things that you could do in this system is you could, you know, he had a type for equality, in fact, of terms. And that was how you would lift terms into types is, you know, three equals three is a type, or two plus two equals four is a type. And then you could inhabit it to witness mathematical equality, which is very important, of course, if you want to have statements about mathematics. Um, and at exactly the same time, completely independently, um, de Brown uh, invented the automath uh, system, which was the world's first uh, mechanical uh, theorem prover. And that, too, had a dependent plate theory that was slightly different, and he came up with his own version of the curry howard correspondence that was slightly different, uh, completely unbeknownst to one another. So it was an idea whose time had come. Um, and uh, where are we going? So, so the, the point here being when we say proofs as lambda terms is when we said a construction, uh, a construction is a procedure, right? So if I a construction to transform a proof of A into a proof of B, right? And at one point we gave it functions encoded as these Goodell codes. Now we give it functions encoded basically as, as Lisp, right? As lambda terms. So that's a very good notion of a function. And it, it, it sort of, it, in retrospect, why did it take them so long to realize that they had a really good notion of functions that had been invented you know, in the 1930s, called lambda terms, and just use that for their functions. There's reasons I won't go into. You know. um, so, intuitionistic type theory, uh, which is what the subject of the talk is today, uh, was developed by uh, Pierre Martin Loft uh, in the early 70s. And uh, in that system, um, it was very close. He was deeply inspired by uh, Howard's work. Howard explained it to, to him himself. And it was almost the same. But uh, there was a big difference, which is Howard said, this is sort of how you can do it for a couple of simple systems. What ITT says is, here is a general mechanism by which we can do this for all of math. He set a really big goal. He wanted to put all of math on a single uniform constructive foundation. And that was why he invented this. Not, not for computers or anything, because he said, this is a uniform way to talk about all of math. And that was his great contribution, is instead of a system like Howard's where you equipped it just with numbers of a certain types and certain relations between them, he described how you introduce new types and how given any concept one could think of, one could come up with a type for it and therefore introduce it directly into the system. Um, and so in this, types may contain terms, but also terms may operate on types. And you may state equality between terms and also between types. And, and as we say here, uh, you know, Martin Loff had this giant leap of the imagination where he said, we're not just going to formalize a system. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to formalize all the systems. Um, so um, the, now these are some sort of follow-ons to Martin Loft's type theory that I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on, but I thought I'd mention them, because it's a much richer world than even a lot of people when you, they start playing with dependently typed languages. You don't realize a lot of sort of the generations of work that have happened. For example, uh, the pure new Pearl system at uh, uh, Cornell has been going on for like 20 years straight, and uh, they, they've got a whole realm of work that's only partially known to other uh, communities yeah. studying dependent types. So you have computational type theory. And, and it's interesting for our talk, because unlike the other systems, constructions here are untyped lambda terms, right? So uh, in this, you can have constructions that loop. You can, have, you can really have anything you want in your construction. It really is just the glop of scheme. And it, and therefore, you have to operate with this system quite differently because uh, you know you, it's not so easy to check that an untyped term actually validates a certain type. You, you sort of need to work interactively. So it's a very interesting road that was gone down. We're not going down there, but it, it relates a bit to the notions presented here. I have a question. Um, when you talk about um, terms, what, what do you mean exactly? Uh, sorry, when I say a lambda term, I. I, I mean basically something you can write in scheme. Now, okay. I mean, I'm ignoring I.O. or something, but it's just, it's, it's just a, a term in the lambda calculus. And, and the thing, of course, that you'd want to say, at least, is, is you don't want to have unbound identifiers. So something that you would write in scheme, and it would start trying to execute, 
before throwing an error if it threw an error, right? As opposed to something you would write in the scheme and it would say, lexer error, you're referring to x and there's no x, and it would, you know, barf at you in the sort of parsing phase. So you're referring to an s expression, basically? Yeah, yeah, not, not just an x, s expression. It, it's, it's a lambda term because it, it's, not, it, it's built out of lambdas and values. It, it's, you know, uh, s expressions can bind together what's inside the s expression, right? Yes, James. Most lisps that, that programmers use have this have these things called built-ins, mm -hmm. and certainly one can include in all these theories built-ins. But but I just you know the, the thing is that the the thing that makes lambda calculus funny is it it tends not to have you know built-ins. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That's so a, I'm, that's I'm a talking big generally deal. like in Martin Law's theory, you certainly don't have built-ins. Right. In New Pearl, you actually do. That's one of the key oh, okay. things, is that you, you can just take an external ring solver, right. and you just plug it right in as a built-in. Oh, okay. and, and, and then you then sort of reason about it, trusting it. So, so it's very extensible, which is why you cannot actually build their system now. You have to run on their servers. Because they've plugged in, uh, like, I don't know, like millions of external tools. So I don't know if anyone knows how to like. Well, it's certainly a task to get all of the different pieces up and running that it coordinates with it. Um, and there's other variations we're not going to talk about here, but they are interesting in their own right, and each of which have, you know, 20-odd uh, papers plus each written on them, and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the calculus mm -hmm. of constructions, and there's a number of variants of that. The LF logical framework, when you got uh, the Edinburgh logical framework, and uh, then things like ELF and TWELF mm -hmm. and others that have LF at the end of their names, all those systems are in the well, spirit of that. And there were some systems like Logo that didn't have LF at the end of their names that were also in the spirit. Lego, pardon me. Um, so anyway, um, what I'm presenting here is mess. I, I, uh, so I, I, I've got a mess to show you. It's, it's the Martin Loaf Extensible Specification and Simulator in Scheme. And what I'm doing is I'm using Scheme as a logical framework. And the logical framework notion is something like the Edinburgh logical framework that I had mentioned, is you don't just have a system for defining a logic. Or a, you, you, you have a sort of a very sparse system in which you can then define many logics. So it's sort of a meta theorem prover or a uh, meta language. And, um, and of course, the name of ML was meta language, and then you wrote ELF in ML, and you know, it's, it's sort of a meta meta language, uh, right? Because I guess what all computer scientists will do is write compilers to write other compilers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the logical really framework has that. It, it, it is sort of the setting in which you are then going to build the logic that you're working on. And we need a setting into which to build this logic because we want to actually implement it. And our setting is Scheme. So we're using Scheme as a logical framework. And um, in this, uh, constructing to transform a proof of A into a proof of B is a Scheme function that transforms an object we judge to be a proof of A into an object we judge to be a proof of B. So now we have to talk about the word <laughs> judgment. What am I missing? Uh, uh, Wait, you well, got a question here. Yes? When are you going to present this uh, math? When? when? Where's the math? No, no, no. When are they going to present uh, this paper? Uh, oh, well, I, 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 it's on GitHub. I'll give a link at the end. It's, it's not a paper. This is just this is, this is something I did in the last couple of weeks in GitHub in 100 lines of scheme. And I'm going okay. um, to I'm going to show you the core of the code in the course of this talk. Um, so um, now, now you can read this paper by Martin Loft. Um, this is a very good description of the word judgment. It's a long paper, so we're not going to uh, go through it. Uh, we're going to say a judgment is a semi-decision procedure whose domain is one or more scheme terms and whose range is true, false, or loop. Right? That's why it's a semi-decision procedure. It may not terminate. In the system I've got, it always terminates. But the reason I want to do this is it's really the way we're going to read judgments is, yes, I can verify this. Yes, I judge this to be true or Right? The, the, those are the two notions we want. Um, we don't really want, because we want an open system. And, and, so, that I, I don't, and, and so that's why I'm calling this a semi-decision procedure. Is you want to read it as, you know, I can judge if something is true. But I really can't always tell if something's false. I can just tell that I, I don't yet know enough to know if it's true. Right? Because what if you extend my system? New knowledge is always possible. Um, so now we're going to have some code, and we'll just get right into it. And I'll show you what I mean by judgments very quickly. Um, so we're going to build up our syntax tree that we talked about. Uh, what I call value formers here are, right, you can think of this as sort of a meta-circular interpreter in the list style, 
is right is in um, if we want to apply something, we need to represent the action of applying it. So we're going to form a structure that you know. Remember structs here. This is all racket, right? So uh, struct just says I've I've got something I'm calling app, and it's got you know two holes in it. One for something we call fun, and one for something we call R. So it's a way to just give a bit more sort of discipline to, to uh, what you could build out of const cells, but it lets us sort of name them a bit more. So this is, it's a record. It's a record with two holes for function and argument. So we apply a function to an argument, and we represent it explicitly here. Um, uh, we call that lambda hyphen pi because it represents lambda and pi both. But it's just body there is intended to be a function that takes something and returns something. So body is a function in scheme. And here, we're going to name the variable just for convenience, so that you know when we do stuff with it, it can tell me that the variable is named x. But you know you wouldn't need to name it; you can just give it an anonymous name because the function just takes a variable and you make up a name and you get there. And vt is the type of the variable, and we haven't got to what that is yet. So it's just, but it's just a scheme function that we've decorated with a couple extra pieces of information for our convenience. So we have just a scheme function and just a pair of things that we're going to call application, and we juxtapose them. And we and I've got this funny guy called the closure, and he's a primitive. And um, we're going to get to him in a minute. And then our type formers are going to be, uh, again, these are just, right, this is just a pair. Uh, uh, the type of a function is what it's from and what it's to. So it's got a domain and a coder name, right? And uh, we could, if you could call that implication instead of type fun, then you could think of it as just, that's logical implication. We say domain implies code domain. That's the type for that. Uh, we have a guy called type unit. And he's just the type of um, the nil, just so that we can speak about nil. And that, that's the one object we're going to start with. Mm -hmm. So that you have A built in, it's nil. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have dependency. Um, and we define right, the type of a pi type is also, it's a domain and a code name, just like before. But we name the element of the domain in which we're given. So var is just a name for it. And, and then we're going to put that to work later. And uh, we're going to say that the type of types is also type. And that's inconsistent. Uh, and I, I've got an appendix that'll explain how we fix that. But it, as a convenience, it's much easier to just say type has type type. And, and Martin Loff actually uh, tried to get away with that for about one year until uh, Girard uh, discovered a paradox in his system. He said, okay, well, uh, we, we gotta be slightly more clever. But for now, we're gonna pretend that type is type. <coughs> um, so now we need a judgment, and we've already met, yeah? Is that to handle the metacircularity problem? Um, <coughs> Yeah, you basically, you can get a Russell's paradox style thing. Just like type can't be a type, set can't be, set can't be in set, otherwise you have a contradiction in the set of sets that do not contain themselves. So we, we just, but it's easily fixed. We just, we ignore it for the time being because it's better to patch it up later. Or if you just don't do anything, that would explode it. Well, we'll get. Ah, that's a big deal. No, no, I, I, I've got an appendix just to solve it. Right. Oh, okay. We'll just ignore it for now and get back to the deal. Okay. So we've already met our first judgment, right? Which is we said there's going to be some distinguished sort of combination of con cells where we can recognize if it's something that we call a type or something that we call a proposition or whatever we want to call it, mm -hmm. as opposed to just all the rest of the group that you can write in scheme, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're going to, and that's going to be a judgment. It's a semi-decision procedure. I'm going to give you some scheme object, and you will say, yes, this is something that you have judged to be a type. So when we said earlier, you know, when something is judged to be a type, what does it mean? Well, it, it means that I ran this function and it returned hash t. That's all mm -hmm. it means. And here's the function. Uh, it says, uh, and I'll explain what a red eval is reduce and evaluate, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so it says, uh, uh, if the thing you gave me is uh, you know, type fun a, b, and so it's a function between two value things, a and b, and a is a type and b is a type, then inductively, the whole thing is a type. Um, Unit type is just all as a type. Um, that, that's a primitive. Uh, if it's a symbol, and we can find that symbol in the context of sort of known symbols that refer to types, and um, that symbol is of type type, then that's a type. Uh, if it's uh, pi type, this is a bit tricky. Uh, if we extend the context to have that name that we already had, then we can judge the codomain, the, the output to be a type too, because the output might actually use the name of the thing in the input in the type in the output, uh, if that makes any sense. So in type fun, you have a 
two contexts are the same and you have no notion of joining the context? Um, yeah, it, exactly so. It's, 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 this is a pure type checker. There's no inference. Okay. So it, it's, it's much more inductive, which is very nice. And, and so therefore in type fun, right, a, a and B can't talk about each other. If it's a function from A to B, then I have to be able to judge independently that A is a type and B is a type. Mm -hmm. However, if it's a function from, um, if it's a pi type, which is a dependent function, from x of type A to B, mm -hmm. B might be a term that contains x somewhere within it. And, and therefore, I, I will also need, and an example of that would be if um, a function, say, from a natural number to a proof that that number is equal to itself. Right? So that takes, you know, lambda or pi of x of type nat arrow, x equals x, which is the type of the proposition x equals x. So the result depends on the input. And therefore, I need to extend my environment <laughs> with that x, so that I know that um, I have that the vet thing is a valid output type. So, or let me say type is a type, and then we say any additional thing that I haven't added yet, and we'll get to that later, might also be a way to judge that t, um, that t is a type. Uh, so we just call this function type additional, and we'll, we'll extend that function later and flesh it in. Uh, but the, in the core unextended theory, we don't need to flesh it in. The type additional can just always return false. We're fine. So no um, sigmas yet? Huh? Is sigma in there or did I? No, there's no sigmas. Uh, we can, we've got to extend the system. Well, actually, I don't even show sigmas in the slides. You can not extend the system okay. with sigmas. You're only doing pi's. Um, when we say it's an extensible sim, uh, system, right. that that's why is you don't need to modify these core functions yeah. to extend the system. You can do it after the fact, and then we're going to show how. And sigmas are one of the things you can add, which is actually how it is in a language like Agda or something. It, doesn't, it comes with built-in mm -hmm. record types, but not built-in sigmas, mm -hmm. because you can just define sigmas in user land. Um, so when I said red of atom, what I mean, well, I, I mean we're going to do reduction. Reduction is one of the only subtleties in the system. Um, and one of the things that I did here is I, I imported sort of an idea from, uh, well actually it, it originally comes from the world of logical frameworks, but uh, it was done in sort of type languages and now we've got it back to an untyped language, which is higher order abstract syntax. Uh, so who here has ever tried to write an evaluator for language like Scheme or something. All right, um, and you, you had to study uh, all the rules of substitution and say, you know, where X does not appear free in, in E, then we get a fresh name and then we have to do all that stuff, right? Yeah. And, and that's sort of a pain to have to remember all those details and, you know, there's a lot of different tricks how, how you make sure that something doesn't appear free because the problem is like, th this actually goes back to the very early days of Lisp. They called it the fun args problem, right? And if you know your early Lisp history, um, you know, you had this sort of semi-dynamic, semi-not, really weird scope. And they solved it with, with scheme once, you know, once and for all by introducing lexical scope, which was really the rules of the lambda calculus. So it's obviously a bit tricky to get right because it, it, it took Lisp a while to do it. Now we know exactly how to do it, but every time you implement it, it's a bit tricky to get right. And there's a lot of papers on all the different ways that you can be sure you've gotten it right. The easiest way to get it right is not to do it at all. <laughs> and to overload the host language, which is why this is called higher order abstract syntax. <coughs> because in this abstract syntax tree, right, we don't have an, a term that has like, you know, actual, you know, symbols for x sitting inside of it. Instead, we have a function. And that function tells us how to substitute. So instead of like rewriting how to substitute in a language where the one thing it knows how to do really well is substitute, we just use the substitution function of the language itself to perform substitution. And, that's what we, and, and, and that is the notion here. So that is why body, as I say, is a function in, um, in the function types. So when I apply lambda pi of var, v, var at type vt body you know, to some argument, I actually take that b, which is a function, I just apply b to the argument. And, and, and therefore we avoid having to do all this messy stuff. It, it's, it's almost cheating, it's almost entirely cheating, but it works very nicely. And you don't have to worry about substitution at all, that lets you shave off a uh, good 30 lines of code and, uh, and, and, and also think about things in a much more uniform and clean way. So, um, uh, and, and, and the one difference here is we, we don't just reduce everything all the way. We're, we're slightly non-strict, we're slightly lazy in our closures. And, and the reason is, sometimes we want to reduce terms because we actually want to compute, right, and find out the value at the end. But sometimes we just want to reduce them a bit 
to find out if they're equal. For example, suppose I give you the function lambda x arrow x and the function lambda I, y arrow y, right? You know, you know, use a function, you know, they're both the identity function. And in fact, you write them both the same, except they're not alpha equivalent, right? You know, because one has uh, the name x in it and the other has the name y. So as, as ASCII strings, they are not identical, right? So what we want to do, though, is we want to say that they're identical and be able to actually judge that they're equal to each other in our system. And we can. And the way we do that is by substituting in, in both cases, the symbol x, or whatever symbol we choose, any fresh symbol we choose, into both of them. And in that case, we know that, um, you know, if I apply the function lambda x arrow x and the function lambda y arrow y, both to the value, you know, tick x, I get the value x back. And that's enough for me to know that they're actually equal. Now, but in order to do that, I obviously can't use built-ins, right? Like, I, I can't, if I have a function lambda x, uh, you know, x plus 2, and now I try to add the symbol x, because I've just symbolically, instead of numerically evaluated it, to 2, then, then I get a type error, the thrown at runtime. So I don't want to, and that's what a closure does. A closure stands in the way of fully evaluating something, so that I can throw in these symbols and look at the sort of semi-symbolically saturated version of stuff whenever I please. And then when I really want to say, no, I must know exactly what it is, I promise you I haven't substituted in any phony stuff. I've only substituted in the real values. Then I want to evaluate it as well. So red of that will just call reduce, except then if it finds a closure, it'll pop the closure open and keep going. So we have force it all the way down and only evaluate as much as you know it's safe to do symbolically when you may have partial information. Um, so again, there's a lot of subtleties in just a few lines here, but it lets us get away with a lot. And, and, and this is something that a lot of systems work very hard to get, dependent type systems, or at least the toy ones, is being able to check for alpha equivalence of expressions and all these other things and use higher order abstract syntax and just use the lambdas that Scheme gave you. You get it for free, almost. And so that's applying the closure. And you can see what it does there is it preserves the closure, but it pushes the application inside so that uh, you don't lose track of the thing. And uh, here, um, we just let that at fun arg is just, you know, you might need to keep reducing if you don't yet have the function in a head normal form, which is to say it's either a closure or a lambda. Uh, you might need to reduce inside of it some more. Uh, but you also do want to check that you don't get in the loop. So you, uh, you say if it's not somehow um, a symbol or something weird, you just throw an error and get out of there so you don't cycle forever. Uh, so I assume that app type basically tells you what the, um, it's the uh, reverse direction, so it tells you what, it gets a type out of the context? Uh, app, is, app is just uh, a label for a record. It, it, okay. app, app XY is just the pair XY, which we consider to be the syntax tree representing applying X to Y, mm -hmm. right? So just like you know, in normal scheme, right, it's the first thing, right? In, if you put a bunch of stuff in parentheses, the first thing is applied to the rest. Yeah. That, that's, it's just another way of saying that. Well, I, I meant for the app, for, oh, I'm sorry, for applying the closure. I'm trying to understand the body of that. Oh, yes. Explaining that? Oh, oh, what I call app type, yes. Yeah, app type. Um, yeah, I, I didn't show app type. Um, what that does is um, it says, well, if it's a function, then, you know, if, if, it's, if it's a function type, then you don't apply it, right? Because it's, a, because it's sort of, you can treat it as a constant pi type. But if you have a pi type where, the, right, where we said that the result can depend on the input, then you actually want to apply it as a function just like you apply the body. So you have to apply in the type as well as the body. Mm -hmm. And app type takes care of that. Sorry, I, 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 I neglected to mention that. Um, so that, that's in the full code listing. Uh, now, a great thing about Scheme as well is, uh, right, you don't need to write a separate uh, reader to, you know, parse some nice looking language. Instead, you can just create your syntactic sugar with macros directly. So we have some simple syntactic sugar I'm going to use from here on out. We're going to find apps, which is going to be apply the first thing to all the rest of this thing. So I don't have to have app of app of app of that, because like, application is just unary here. So we just call apps. And in, in fact, that's not even a macro. That's just a function scheme. A function and scheme. So that's why it's nice to have a logical framework. <laughs> and so you can sort of you know, just generate some things like that on the fly and get nicer syntax. And here, instead of having to you know, explicitly produce lambda of x and write all of that stuff in the body, we already said we're in a lambda term. So this is a macro. That's going to, every time I say lamb of x of type t body, it's going to, you know, quote the x so that I've turned it into a symbol automatically 
And then, you know, on the other hand, it'll leave it free in the body and it'll close over it with the lemma and so forth. So again, this just really reduces the line noise and lets you pretend you're writing directly in your uh, object language instead of sort of the elaborated form in your host language, as they call it. Um, and closing, that, that's a stupid syntax rule. It, it used to do more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> clearly. Um, um, so, okay. Uh, in the previous slide, what's the difference between lambda and phi? Ah, as I've described, uh, yeah, they, they actually look the same here. Um, <laughs> and, and because it's true, lambda and pi at the value level are represented by the same thing. They're represented by something we call the lamb hyphen pi, because it can represent both of them. Yeah. Um, it, but for our sanity when we're writing terms, we might want to call it which one we know it's going to be. <laughs> so that, that, that's it. it it's mm -hmm. just... Um, the uh, synonyms. Yeah, yeah there, there's synonyms. Um, it's for the human. Right. Oh, yeah, I, I, this started out very high level, and then you were like, show me the code, and now you've got the code. <laughs> Aren't you sorry? Um, <laughs> so uh, here, here we go. Here's our second judgment. Um, right, and, this, and we've already met the need for it, because the first judgment only got us insofar as we can recognize well-formed propositions. But those propositions, as you will recall, included nonsense, right? You know, included truly false things, included things that were almost incoherent. So what you want is you want to say, how do we verify it? This is what I was talking about. Right? How do I check that some term realizes some proposition and gives it validity and truth in a way that I, I can believe it? Um, and, and that's all in this second um, guy right here. X has type T. And that's what relates the propositions to their realizers. And uh, so again, now we're given X and T both. And it's a judgment over them. Uh, if it's a closure, uh, we just trust that the type is what it claims to be. So you better be correct. That's sort of like a foreign function import, as I mentioned. So you better make sure you give it the right signature. Um, if, if it's a symbol, you look it up and just check that the type that you find in the context matches what, uh, you've, uh, what you're hoping it's going to be. And again, right, this does no type inference. So you're given the full type and the full term, and you're just verifying that the two <coughs> correspond. Yes. Can you say a couple words about what, what the, the role of the context is? Sorry, uh, yes. Uh, in all these things, we're passing around a guy we call CXT for context. And uh, all it is, is it's a cons list of, uh, or, or it's an association list of um, uh, where the first thing is symbols and the second thing is, um, uh, is the types that we've assigned to those symbols. And so you just keep track of other names in your environment <coughs> that, and what the types are of such things. Um, and that's all it is. And then when we call extend context, that's a macro I didn't show you as well. And it, it does one other nice thing, which is if I try to add something named A to the context, and there's already an A there, instead it'll add something named A prime to the context. If there's an A prime, it'll add something named A double prime to the context, and so forth. And then it gives that back to you as a... Uh, uh, as new var and new context in this sense, so that I can now have my extended context and whatever this variable, however many primes it had to add to it. And so that ensures your freshness of names. Mm -hmm. So is the context only types or is it also bindings for some? Uh, no, there's no value bindings in the context. No value bindings? Okay. We, we remember, when we substitute, we don't need to carry around value bindings because we just apply the function directly. That's okay. higher order abstract syntax. Okay. Okay. It's only the typing environment that we need to carry around. Mm -hmm. So your contexts are sort of global Well, no, no, the context grows. You usually start in the empty context. You could start in a context <coughs> with some global propositions. Right. But as you descend right. further down the lambdas, you keep adding to it. Every time you introduce a fresh variable, everywhere where you may use that variable, you need to know the type that came with that variable. Luckily, every time we introduce a variable, we say what type it is in our syntax. So we never have to figure that out later. Well, like just saying, you might imagine a case where you have um, some auxiliary type you want for something, and then you don't want it for too long, so you discard it. So maybe a, something that behaves a bit like local scope. Well, we have lexical scope. I, I, we'll yeah. come back. Yeah, yeah, that yeah that, 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 that's the way you get local scope. We're very primitive here. Okay. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you were in a system where you could have more than one statement, then you'd certainly want something like that. <laughs> um, all right. So, all right, so there we are. Um, <coughs> Uh, again, now we can verify that something of lambda pi has type of a function by checking that um, the type that the variable is, that the, the, we, we say that like, you know, lambda x of type t. So we better check that that t, you know, is equal to the type that we claim. And so we call eq type on it. 
And then we better check that, um, you know, in a context where that uh, T sort of exists, then, um, then, then that the uh, uh, body is applied to the new variable has, has the right type as well, right? So, like, so that we, we apply the body symbolically, you can see here, that's what I'm talking about, not to, to give this new variable that we stuck into a context where we know it has a type. And then we type check the result of that. So we sort of partially apply the function. As, or not partially apply, partially evaluate, I guess is the right term, uh, the function, or abstractly evaluate, that's the word. We abstractly or um, interpret or evaluate the function as applied to this variable, in, and then ask what's the type of the resultant thing, and that better correspond to the B that we promised, the codomain that we promised. And that's how you verify that a function has the right type. And uh, actually, I'll come back, uh, I think, in the next slide, because it's, it, it's an interesting idea. Um, Lambda pi is sort of the same, you just, uh, for pi type, you just do a bit more work. And that's not it. So th that's our entire procedure for verifying the truth of a statement. Right? And, and we don't have a depe fully dependent type system yet. Um, we've got a partially dependent one. Mm -hmm. But we, we've actually already given exactly what I promised, which is a system that lets you have atoms and introduce new knowledge through closures from the rest of the world and uh, then, you know, form propositions about them. And it's very complete, actually. And then, then also, because um, we know the lambda calculus can express a lot, right? And then um, not only that, but verify those propositions. Um, now, uh, this is exactly what I was talking about. I didn't realize I could go forward a slide here. Um, and this is the interesting bit. When I was talking about the symbolic or the partial evaluation, is, uh, there's, again, there's a notion where it's a, a type, a, the generic argument of that type. Right? The symbol that we've introduced, it's fresh in the environment. So it's any old argument of that type, in a sense. An argument of that type where you can't know anything about it except that it has that type. And I, I'm not going to dwell on that more, but when I was thinking of it in, in those terms, it's obviously suggestive to some of us who... <laughs> but there's a relationship to a generic point here, in some sense, that, 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 that's very subtle. And I'm not quite, but it, it just hit me, so I thought I'd mention that. And in a dependent function, we should get to this. Because in fact, if I gave it to you but didn't give this type pi one, I would have given you a type checker for normal lambda calculus. And uh, almost the only difference between um, the normal lambda calculus and our dependently typed system, in, in, at least in this very minimal example, is that here, as we check the type, we also have to apply right, the body, uh, not just the body of the uh, lambda term, but the B, which is bound in the type, that also contains the variable. So we also have to apply that. So in a sense, you can think of the core difference between checking uh, a type system with and without dependent types. It's just uh, these couple extra lines here, which means that you reduce inside the types as you check. And um, the, the thing that's important here is note that here we didn't reduce, we just applied it. So you can treat that as just any old substitution. Here we're reducing. So that means there's computation intermixed with type checking. Right? You don't have two different phases is if I want to know what the type is uh, of something, and, and it's, it's dependently typed, I have to push that thing all the way through. And I might have to turn the crank and reduce until I get to a normal form of a type. Because what if, what if what I get at the end of it is, you know, apply this lambda term to this other thing? Well, I don't know what apply this lambda term to this other thing means as a type until I actually apply it. And, and so this right here is really the key difference and the only important thing that distinguishes a dependent type system from a, a non-dependently type system. It, it, uh, and there's other things we'll add to it. But it was when I was at Stephanie Warrick's talk and she pointed that out that I realized, oh yes, I, I, I can write one of these and that's how I'm going to do this talk. And I'm just going to write one because it <laughs> really just comes down to that very simple thing. Um, now we get more interesting. We have a third judgment. And, and you'll note this, this came up. We used it in Passant, like right here, for example. We said if, you know, everywhere we go, we say, well, if the argument has a type that's equal to the type we say the argument should have, well, how do we know it's equal as a type? Mm -hmm. You know, well, I mean, we could just call EQ, um, right, or equals, right, query in, in scheme, and just, well, it's whatever uh, that particular specification of scheme has decided equality means. Uh, I don't really necessarily trust that, but especially since scheme has, like, what, three or four different uh, functions mm -hmm. for equality at least? Mm -hmm. Which one do you pick? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's not very sound. Uh, you know, what if I run in a different scheme version? Um, so, here, we're going to define type equality explicitly. And, again, here now we're doing induction over uh, 
two things at once, right? So we have to sort of reduce them both. And in every case, it's in lockstep. In every case, this is a perfectly inductive thing, right? You can see it always terminates. Things always get smaller. And you're just splitting things apart and learning about things via the properties of their components. So this is very natural, uh, the way all the judgments are structured, which is inductive. And here, uh, we, re we reduce both uh, types. And to know if two, type fun uh, two function types are equal, we, 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 is to know that their uh, first elements are equal and that their domain, uh, codomains are equal. Right? This is recursive. Right? You, you can sort of write this in your sleep when, when you think about it. You just do the obvious thing. Uh, for a pi type, we <coughs> now have this thing again where you need to sort of go under and uh, extend the context and apply to check for the equality. Here we don't call reduce, you'll know, because when we recur into EQ type, we call that eval again. And so we, you, know, you eventually reduce. You, you just don't have to do it right there. And, uh, and here again, we uh, symbols you just look up and so forth. Um, and that's it. And, and each time, in case we have, or, or any additional rules we may add, and we will. Uh, and this is what I've been saying. Uh, intentional type theory is an open system, right? This is not a system uh, that is designed to say, we only give you lambda, like the lambda calculus is, and, and it's all lambda. It's a system where we give you at least lambda and uh, application, and maybe unit. Uh, and then you can just keep throwing in more stuff. Well, how do you throw in more stuff? Well, I've given you your judgments, so I just need to tell you how to extend your judgments. So what does it mean to add a new type? Say I want to add booleans or something. Well, I need to tell you how to recognize bool as a type, right? So I could add something to the is type judgment. I need to, have to tell you how to recognize a term is of type boolean. So I add something to the has type judgment. I need to tell you how do I recognize that type bool equals type bool. Well, that's sort of trivial, but I should probably tell you anyway, uh, just for completeness sake. And, and then I've added a new term. So. Um, we describe how to extend judgments over them, and, and that's enough to add new things. But if you want to introduce such objects or work with them, you also produce these extra functions that we call introductory and delimitor functions. And those are sort of the primitives, or the FFI imports. Right? The rest of it is just changing the judgment rules, but you want to compute with these guys. You need to import from the outside world, from, from the rest of math. And uh, here uh, we define uh, intro true and intro false. So the introductory functions are very boring. They're really just values. Um, <laughs> in other cases, they might be more interesting. Um, now, the induction, or the elimination, is a lot more interesting. We're going to say it's a function, and this is not the type of the function. This is the body of the function. That says, give me um, some, um, some p, which is a function from bool to type. So give me, and we call those a type family. So give me something that will send the values true or false to two different values, or maybe two values that are the same, in our universe of types, right? So it could send bool to, it can send true to integer, if we had integers, sure. and false to string, if we had string. And then, now that you've given me this type family that says how to send values to types, now um, give me a value of one type, which is we get by applying that function to the value true, and give me a value of the other type, which then we know what that type is by applying that type function we're given to the value false. So here we see, right, this is a type, and the type has computation based on prior arguments that we had to our function. So this is the dependent typing in action. Um, and then give me a Boolean. And now I'll give you back something in the closure so that I promise, I promise it will be the type of applying this p to whatever boolean you gave me, right? So this is a way of saying, if you tell me how to act on true and how to act on false, I can tell you how to act on anything you can give me. And um, I promise that that's what I'm going to do. And then how do I actually fulfill that promise? Well, now I have to write my function, where I say, well, give me the thing, and I have to force it because it, it might be lazy. And then if, if it's true, then give me x, otherwise give me y. But if is a primitive, so we imported if from the outside world of scheme, and uh, now we've uh, you know added if to our system. Um, the, the work was typing if, right, in a sense. Yeah, yeah. All of this is a, is a very rich type for if. Yeah. And as a Lisper, you might appreciate when you know every time you come up with some function where you're like, well, can your type system type this? You know. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> if you're a dependent type system, I mean, you can type this. You can sort of type whatever. You do. Um, 
unless it makes no sense at all. Um, now, you can type that too, just don't want um, to. Now, this is the pair type that I was talking about. And it, you know, I don't know how long I just want to walk through these definitions, but you can go arbitrarily slow um, or not. <laughs> It basically works the same. Uh, the intro here is more interesting because um, 